So it's a real pleasure for me to be uh, introducing you uh, Oda Bitkori. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she was uh, prior to that a lecturer and a postdoc at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Her research focuses on data analytics, operations research, and she has a keen interest for data-driven uh, decision-making and machine learning. Her, the applications that uh, she has been involved in is healthcare, business analytics, supply chain and management. But uh, it's a real pleasure to be to have you today. I'm really looking forward to learn about uh, your recent uh, results in data-driven optimization. Um, thanks so much, Eric, for organizing this wonderful workshop, and thanks everyone for participating. It's, it's such a pleasure uh, to give a talk in front of such a talented group of audience. So today's talk is over the past few years, uh, I was focused uh, uh, in more on data-driven optimization, facing more uh, complex data environments. So uh, I uh, so I give a brief review of a couple of works, and then I get to the main uh, talk. And the reason that I'm doing is that I'm looking always looking forward collabor to collaboration opportunities, and I thought that it would be good to have some reviews. Yeah. So uh, so uh, here is the outline of the talk. I'm gonna give a brief overview on robust artificial intelligence for kidney exchange uh, and our work on supply chain flexibility but then the main part of the talk is about data driven optimization facing real-time non-stationary data or dealing with missing data so the first part i'm doing it very fast so I have these wonderful collaborators at, in the University of Maryland, and they are working on kidney exchange. So the kidney exchange process is basically is that you have a, a pair of uh, patient donors. For example, I need a kidney, and then my brother, uh, so there is no cost associated here. My <coughs> brother is willing to give me his kidney. And then the problem here is that uh, we, we, most of the time, the patient and the person who wants to give them the kidney, they are incompatible. So what happens is that, uh, okay, so my brother uh, is willing to give his kidney to someone else as long as he makes sure that I receive a kidney. So this is called the kidney exchange. So this, uh, so, so this is the, the process where patient in need of a transplant can swap their willing donors to find the compatible match. So, so this is the, usually the UNOS, the United uh, Nation uh, of Organ, uh, 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 Organ Sharing, they have these graphs that contain donor patients and then there are, and their goal is to find cycles and uh, so, for example, a, a cycle here is, uh, so this is one cycle. Uh, if I have a cycle here, that cycle means that everyone here is satisfied. So this patient donates, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, sorry, this patient received from this donor, then, uh, so, so everyone is happy. So, uh, and then we also have some donors that they are just volunteers. They don't need anything. So these are, we call them non-directed don donors. So as a result, the problem is to find like a cycles and chains. So that's a problem that people in kidney exchange try to solve. Uh, they call it a matching problem. But the point is that there are many uncertainties in this matching. So first of all, the weights of these uh, edges or arcs are not known because they are function. They are function of many things. It could be that one pa one patient is <coughs> very sick, very old. So the weight of the, so there are uncertainties associated to weight of the transplant, and there are other things. For example, for many reasons, after they do this matching, the transplant can fail. So these guys can go to hospital, and in the last minute, the doctor says that I. I won't do the surgery. 
So there are many uncertainties. So in this project, we had these three papers that we are talking about many uh, robust uh, artificial intelligence for kidney exchange. And I think there are many, uh, still there are many interesting problems in this area. So I just wanted to give a brief introduction for the uh, future collaboration. And the other uh, uh, thing that I was working on supply chain was the supply chain flexibility, which was about, uh, uh, so I don't want to get to the detail of it, which was about matching production plants and products. But the point is, was that the products are, the demand for products are very uncertain. So, and uh, to manage this uncertainty, they make the supply chain more flexible. In a sense, they add more links to the supply chain, but these links are very expensive. So the there are many problems here uh, associated here is about the uncertainties in the demand distribution, uncertainties in the cost and so on. So I, I still uh, think there are many interesting problems in this area, so I just wanted to <coughs> give a brief introduction. So if uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, so if not, I would uh, jump to the main part of the talk. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, the main part of the talk is two of uh, the recent work uh, on data-driven decision-making. This work was motivated by inventory management. So this is the demand data of the Amazon that we got from Amazon China. So for example, this is the demand of day to 100, 200, 300. So the problem is that this demand is highly fluctuating. And because the process is unknown, because this fluctuations are depend on many factors that we do not know. So, uh, so and then the question is how to make decision at each given day based on the knowledge that we have and based on the uh, uh, information that we have received. So unlike the existing uh, work, we don't assume that we have some knowledge about the mark of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the non uh, the non stationary process. So, for example, uh, this is could be inventory management for a warehouse. So uh, that demand data that I have shown, uh, it could be the uh, demand data of like uh, for one warehouse. And the manager of the warehouse needs to uh, decide for the inventory level at each day. So we, uh, so the main problem here is that a reliable forecast is not available for the future. And most of the existing works are based on uh, simulation and predictions. So what we did here is we try to uh, come up with some heuristic algorithms to solve. So we have four algorithms and we try to benchmark those algorithms. So if I want to formulate such problems, I can say that, okay, so I have these data that is coming sequentially. It could be the product demand, it could be anything else. So for example, at day n, we have observed d1 to dn, right? And then we make some decision to optimize this cost function. So each day, this is the observation that, uh, so maybe I do annotate. So these are the observations <coughs> that I have by day n, and this is the decision that I make by the day n, okay? So the, then the data season, changes over time, the current distribution is unknown, and uh, we assume that we know the function C, and the, uh, so, so one uh, assumption that we make here is that, uh, okay, so the data is fluctuating, but the current decision, we make it based on the current distribution. So if I know that this current distribution is <laughs> this normal distribution, I make the decision 
uh, for the current distribution. I think that's something that people people do in inventory management. So if they have an idea of which data season we are in, based on that they make the decision. So so they need this data to verify the current data the season, and these decisions are, for example, inventory or other decisions. Okay, so. So we propose four approaches. So uh, integrated parametric and non-parametric. This, this thing is that, uh, so this is a kind of a Bayesian approach. So uh, in this algorithm, so for example, uh, in the parametric case, I have a set of distributions. For example, I have, these are, I, I think these are the set of my possible distribution, so the 1000 distribution. So I use the data and some Bayesian analysis to estimate the possibility. So I cannot determine the current season for sure, but I can estimate the probability of each of the distribution to be the current season. So we estimate the possibility of the current distribution, then we formulate the problem, you know, <clears throat> and uh, as a kind of a stochastic optimization, and we evaluate the cost of different policies and find the best cost. So, uh, so this is what we uh, what we do actually. So, for example, in the parametric approach, in the parametric approach, we assume that we have the uncertainty set of distribution. So we assume. <clears throat> all the, for example, all the dis normal distributions of this range and so on. So we define two events. So for example, the first event is that just our observations of the demand. The second event is that, uh, okay, the current distribution is uh, this distribution, okay? So then uh, what is uh, the, uh, the optimization problem can be written as follows. So this is the, probability that the current distribution is PK given the observation, okay? And this is the cost function. This denotes the expected cost using the policy PK prime while the real distribution is PK. So in a sense, for different policies, we evaluate this function and our policy would be the one that minimizes this. Am I going uh, yeah, fast? Uh, yeah, so please interrupt me if there is any question, but uh, uh, yeah, so, so this is optimization essentially is kind of transformation of the optimization that I had before. Suppose that I want to evaluate the previous function on the policy based on the data season PK prime. Then what I would do is that Okay, I would actually uh, evaluate what is the probability that the current season is PK. And what is the cost function when the current season is PK and uh, the decision is based on PK prime. And I do the summation because this is kind of the Bayesian process. I, I, I do not know the distribution and the chance of the distribution changing for sure. So this is what we get, and uh, okay, so fortunately it has some nice, uh, some nice closed formulation. So for example, we can find the, uh, uh, some benchmark like theta and say that, okay, if this probability, probability of being <coughs> in season K2 is based on the, uh, the data that we have observed is greater than equal to theta, then the optimal policy is based on K2. So this leads to easy to implement algorithm. So we, then we try to go to a more complicated cases. The more complicated case, again, we consider uh, this, uh, uh, this Bayesian process. But the problem is that, uh, okay, I want to 
So the problem is that here is a non-parametric setting. So in the non-parametric setting, I do not know the uncertainty set of possible distribution. Uh, so uh, for example, if I, uh, the current distribution is PK1, because as I said, so the policies are, uh, have correspondence to the current distribution. So once I find the uh, current distribution, I uh, kind of have the policy. So uh, as I said in the previous formulation, we had to evaluate this probability. So what we did to evaluate this probability based on data was that uh, we define some function W, W of X is ratio of PK2 of X over PK1 of X. And then we write this probability as, uh, as this W function. And then we try to estimate this W using one dimensional Gaussian kernels. And we find these coefficients by minimizing the KL divergence between the estimation and, uh, and the empirical data distribution. So this is, in a spirit, it's very similar to uh, the previous slide that I had. Very in a spirit, we solved the same problem. But the good thing about the previous problem was that we had these uncertainties. So now we do not have it, so it's hard to calculate these properties. So that's why we uh, offered some uh, non-parametric approach to uh, non-parametric approach to solve. Hi Hoda, I have a quick question. I might have missed it, sorry. But how no. are the PKs probability distributions are constructed? So uh, this, we try to solve this problem. I I, I just assume that I have some set of distribution. I, for example, it could be that if a demand of a certain product, maybe I have the historical data, for example, for the last 10 years, and then I kind of infer the possible distribution from there. But you don't assume any certain structure of an ambiguity set for them. Exactly. They are just any random right now estimations. But okay. even, for example, in, uh, for, for example, for Amazon, if some product is not new, for example, I probably have some good distribution. For example, uh, it could be that winter, fall, all these have different distribution, but I have a good uh, set of possibilities. But for example, when a data is relatively new, I cannot form this distribution. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yep, thank you. Thank you. So then the next step was to, in the non-parametric setting, we assume that we do not know that set of distributions. So in a sense, we assume that, okay, this is the current distribution, this is the future distribution. We look at the ratio and use it to estimate this guy. So this comes with lots of mathematics to estimate W using one-dimensional Gaussian kernels and doing K L divergence. So these are two integrated approach. We also did some separate analysis. The separate analysis, maybe it's very, uh, it, the separate analysis were just like, so I look at the distributions and then uh, suppose uh, suppose this, this is kind of a set of distributions, right? So for each, uh, for, for each season, this is the mean, right? The mean of that season, and this is the data of that season, okay? So in a sense, this is kind of a loss of framework because I, I want to uh, kind of make a trade-off between the variance of the seasons and also the number of seasons. So if two seasons are equal, this becomes zero, I see. <clears throat> because lambda t is the average of the, the season. If not, it's, uh, so we make this formulation. So basically, for example, <coughs> for the data set uh, from one to n, so I, ha I have this one. For example, this is the variance 
so for example, if I had three seasons, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, this would be the variance for the three seasons. So for some seasons, the average is lambda one. For some other seasons, the uh, data points, the average is lambda two. For some other data points, the average is lambda three. And here is the penalty. So I get a penalty because I have three seasons, right? So, so we did this to uh, find, uh, kind of uh, determine the current data distribution <coughs> based on the observed data. And then once we have that, <coughs> we, we solve the optimization problem and we use the distributionally robust optimization to solve, uh, solve those problems because uh, these problems usually the amount of the data is a small so we, for a, a particular demand season so I cannot do sample average approximation and etc. So uh, and then this approach also we had parametric and non-parametric so then what we did is we tried to look over, for example, different data environments. So uh, for example, this could be uh, the data environment for different products in Amazon. So some products are new, some products are older, some products the demand is very fluctuating, very seasonal, for some others it's not. So we try to benchmark those approaches. So here is what we get, for example. So, <clears throat> so the integrated, uh, so uh, we kind of also uh, evaluated the opt optimal policy. So it turns out that these heuristics are uh, very close to the optimal policy. And then for different data environment, one of these are good. So here, if the environment is high bias over variance, by high bias, I mean that the mean of the demand seasons are, the difference is large comparing to the variance, then these guys are better. Or if we have low historical data, the non-parametrics are better. So there's, I think this, the, the main message we try to have in this uh, inventory paper was that for different data environments, one policy could be good. And then we just uh, also implement it. So for example, here, uh, this line here is the average of this data season, right? So. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, the algorithm captured this data, this, this as data season. It captured this one as data season. In a sense, the algorithm needs to find the trade off between noise and, for example, here there are fluctuations, but the algorithm uh, find them as noise. So they, they, it characterizes all of them as one data season. So this is what we did in this paper. So. <laughs> then uh, one other advantage of the algorithms was that they are very easy to implement. So we could, for, for some dynamic problem, we can run the algorithm every day and find the solution every day over the time. So uh, any question about this part of the talk before I go to the missing data part? I could ask a question. So you say you use site information, but uh, in your second approach, mm -hmm. the, the non-parametric was using demand as the say, site information. Is that it? Because you have an X in your model, but I didn't, I didn't follow what was X. This one, yeah. Yeah, yeah in, this, in this model here. And it just, uh, for, uh, for example, if we are at day X, what is this? Uh, what is the range of this probability? So, so, but so, uh, what what is x? Because you have a kernel that looks at the similarity between x and dt. So you're comparing the demand that you just observed <coughs> to uh, the demand in your data set. Uh, uh, 
uh, yes, that's that's what I think. Yes. Okay. So I. So you didn't include things like uh, I don't know season or month of the year or other type of site information. You're purely basing your site information on historical data. Right. Historical exactly. patterns. Yeah, exactly. That's what. I okay. So, and then the, uh, there are other papers that we are working on. For example, uh, this problem that Amazon is currently uh, facing that they want to make it exact. So what the, the problem that we were addressing was single inventory problem. But what Amazon does is that they have many warehouses and then they observe data for different locations and they have to make decisions every day, like a dynamic decision about the allocations. So these are, uh, in a sense, <laughs> these are large scale optimization problems with real time data. So that's something that we are thinking about currently. Uh, but I think the next part of the talk might is probably more interesting for optimization audience. So can I start this part? Yeah. So uh, this part, uh, we try to address the uh, problem of missing data in data-driven optimization. For example, assume that uh, you have portfolios, okay? So you have three assets, for example. On this day, you only have the data of this asset. On the other day, you only have the data of this. So, so there are many data that are missing. So when we usually do the data driven optimization, we uh, don't think of, uh, and these missing patterns could be, uh, I recently saw some papers that they kind of try to solve based on, for example, the marginal data. But here we just try to address the issue of the missing data. So there are missing data in some dimensions and then the sharing of the data among different dimensions is limited. And for example, the correlations, so it's not uh, easy to evaluate the correlations. And it could be that <coughs> different uh, components have uh, different dimensions. For example, for one asset, it's a new asset. For other asset, it has been here for uh, one year and so on. Or the same, I think, happens a lot in Power Grid. In Power Grid, we have different nodes and we have the data for different nodes. And these data are, uh, we do not know the correlation values. And this data is very unreliable. There are many data missing and so on. So I think <laughs> missing data is a common uh, problem in data-driven optimization, for example, uh, data to uh, deliver intelligent transportation problem, they rely on historical data. And then uh, I think about 40%, one paper, this paper says that, okay, about, I think 40% uh, of the data are missing. The same is the data of the power grid. There are lots of missing data there. And also in financial market, I think that's a, a big issue there. So <clears throat> first of all, I need to uh, uh, on this, uh, I need to discuss some setting for the missing uh, <coughs> data me mechanism. So suppose I have these vectors, for example. So maybe I have my pen again. Uh, sorry. My pen again. Okay. So suppose I have my, for example, this one S1, S2, S3. So this is the three dimensional vector, for example, for three assets. So, but I'm not be able to observe all of this. So it could be that I, uh, so if I don't observe uh, something with loss of generality, I just put zero here. So zero, S2, S3. So we want to <coughs> see what, so we call this the partial observed data. So for any S, we observe this one. So this would be the observations. 
So the first question is that, <coughs> so we make an assumption about the missing property. So the missing property is the missing at random. So it means that the, <coughs> the missing probability of a, a missed value is independent of the value itself. So I think that makes sense because I think the many of the patterns that appear in uh, missing mechanism, it's not about the value, it's about the some hidden pattern, for example, in transportation system, in energy system. So it says that, okay, the probability that I get here, it doesn't depend on the value of S1. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not depends on the value of S1. S1 could be two, could be three and so on. So that's what I get. And then this also is the definition that, okay, for this particular observation could be that with this missing data, a, a mechanism, I, uh, uh, there could be many S's. So this would be the S's that could map to this S of the rest. So that's an assumption that we make about the missing values. Then uh, as usual, we try to solve the stochastic program. So the, uh, so the, this S in the stochastic program is our real data, our real S. And ideally we want to, <coughs> we want to find some X, for example, this Q function could be the, uh, the, uh, the portfolio or optimization or whatever. And then this X is some uh, decision and S is uh, the data that we have. But the problem here is that we do not observe S fully. So Q, X, of, uh, X and S represent a cost function with respect to X and X is a feasible region. And we, uh, so one way to do this is that, uh, so once we have the data with missing values, we can apply the data imputation first. We impute the missing values and then we solve this expectation problems. But uh, usually it doesn't lead to a uh, good performance. So we try to address this problem. So <clears throat> what we do, we try to develop a distributionally robust optimization framework with uh, missing values, right? So here is that, uh, so, uh, uh, so here is the cost function and this is the probability of this observation, probability of S. But because we, we do not know this, cannot estimate this probability very well, we can assume that this probability come from a set of distribution. So we mean we find a, a solution in the worst case scenario. For example, in the correlation values, maybe I cannot estimate the correlation value completely, but maybe I can come up with the uh, solution. So what we do is that first we talk about, okay, for in this setting, how to choose the ambiguity set, then can we, prove something, can we show the, for example, the statistical consistency and out of sample performance, tractability and some, so, so we define a DRO framework and we try to address all the typical questions for the DRO framework. So this, I think these things have to be inferred from the information that we have for the missing value. So usually when we have an ambiguity, uh, for example, uh, we call, uh, we discuss the ambiguity set with uh, partially observed data. So we usually define the ambiguity set. So for example, if we find the center of the distributions, we find some center for the ambiguity set these are the general distribution for the S value that we have some missing observations of it. 
And then this ambiguity set would be the distance of this distribution minus nominal, nominal distribution is less than equal to this gamma, right? So, uh, so this is the typical distribution. So we need to discuss how to calculate the nominal distribution. But once we have the nominal distribution, we can think of many uncertainties. The first thing is that, okay, so here we consider a finite support. So we assume that this summation is one. So that means that T is a distribution. We have this P is greater than zero. And then, so these are the typical condition for a probability distribution. And this is the distance function. So we consider all these distance functions. For example, F divergence, Wasser time distance, L2 norm, and L1. Uh, so the, the first question is how to, based on the missing values and what we have observed, how we actually estimate this nominal distribution. So these are the different, uh, uh, different uncertainties. So the nominal distribution is actually, it's easy to compute uh, it, it, because <coughs> we just find the nominal distribution by maximum likelihood estimation. And the good thing is that because of this missing at random assumption, if we write the maximum likelihood estimation, we can simplify it and it become kind of convex optimization. So we can find the nominal distribution by a convex optimization. So these are the observations, these are the S inside that could lead to those observations and so on. So we can find computationally, we can find the center of the ambiguity set based on the partial observation. And based on that, we can define the ambiguity set. So uh, our ambiguity set, it has, so our optimism, so these are maybe some, uh, uh, some things that we typically try to solve for uh, distribution generally robust optimization, for example, the statistical consistency. So this says that, okay, so if the number of samples goes to infinity and the radius of the uncertainty set goes to zero, then the objective value of the uh, stochastic optimization and uh, you know, uh, and the DRO formulation converge to each other. And if the solution is unique, that unique solution also converge to each other. And I think the, the idea of the proof was that if N goes to infinity, the center of the ambiguity set actually will converge to the true distribution. The true distribution of S that we do not fully know. So that's one thing that we have. Then the other thing is that the finite sample guarantee. So, so for the finite sample guarantee, so that, okay, suppose B star represents the true joint distribution, and these are one optimal solution for the DRO model and the end data, then uh, uh, so we have this inequality. In a sense, the uh, DRO solution bound the real solution with a good, with a, uh, with a good probability, okay? So then the idea here was that the, the idea of the proof here was that the deviation between the true distribution and the nominal distribution can be approximated by a normal distribution asymptotically. And we use that to find these bounds. So we also have some sort of finite sample guarantee for this DRO 
forever. So in a sense, this, these things kind of justify the uh, DR of forever. Then what we need to say that, okay, can we have a tractable form reformulation for this DRO? And it looks like that we have actually. So for example, in L1 norm, uh, if, uh, if this function looks nice, for example, or whatever. So, and so this optimization would be equivalent to an uh, easy to implement optimization. Okay. And in case that QXS is uh, this function, X is polytope, our model is equivalent to a linear program. And if this function is convex, uh, and X is a convex set or mixed integer linear set, our model would be mathematically tractable. So then for different cases, we try to, so we also <clears throat> look at uh, the L2 norm. For L2 norm also uh, still the problem is tractable and uh, we provide one reformulation, which is a kind of second order uh, conic program. And then there are uh, for F divergence and Lasser time distance, there are lots of literature there. So we could actually get the result based on the, uh, by referring to the literature. So, So at the end, I uh, kind of uh, try to do some <laughs> numerical ex experiments. So uh, I look at, uh, we look at the data that come from the historical returns of the exchange trade funds for the US central bank. So in this data, there are lots of missing values. And for the portfolio optimization, they usually have this mean risk model. A mean risk model, and then the mean risk model. So here is the average of uh, returns, and this is the risk associated to returns. So we can reformulate this, and this looks like a, a nice optimization to solve. So we, we try to actually solve this problem. Uh, by data imputation and by DRO method. And usually the out of sample performance for the R approach is much better in a sense. So, so we, we kind of get a better uh, performance and also kind of better reliability for our approach. So I guess I'm running maybe a little fast, but yeah, so, so that was the, uh, the agenda that I had over the past few years to uh, try to devise analytics method for, uh, for the, uh, that outperform the estimate, then op uh, optimize paradigms and works in scenario that uh, uh, more complex in a sense that the data is more complex or there are difficulties in data system integration. So I'm happy to discuss anything more and uh, get questions and yeah. Thank you, Oda, for your, your talk. It was very interesting. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, Joannes uh, Hoiset has a question. Hello, Joannes. <laughs> Hi, Hoda. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, uh, you have a, a more detailed question. I didn't fully understand that maximum likelihood estimation with missing data. Can you go back to a slide and explain how that missing data part comes in? Uh, yeah, there, exactly. So I, what the script is? Here, it's the... Uh, the the S script so uh, S is the observations of the data that we have, 
And here is the, uh, for example, this is the observations that we have. And this one is uh, what could be associated. So these are the possibilities. For example, when we have a when we have uh, a particular observation, then we can, uh, based on that, we can say that, okay, this is the range of possibilities that I have the, for the full uh, observation. And based on that, for example, if uh, I don't have the proof on top of my head, uh, I'm sorry, I, I had to, I can look up the, but uh, the whole idea was that, okay, I have this partial observation and with maximum likelihood, uh, we, we've, uh, I want to find the, uh, with these probabilities, and I want to find the probability of real S with maximum likelihood estimation. And then we formulate this problem, and then uh, what happens is that because we had this missing at random property, many things simplified, and then we get to this uh, convex optimization. I'm happy to share the proof with you, actually. So because I don't have the exact equation right now on top of my head, but uh, what that was the main idea. Sounds like it's equivalent to uh, augmenting your data set by duplicating the data with the missing values and complete completing the missing value with all possibilities. So if you have only one term that's missing, you duplicate and you put in this one term all the possible realization at, of that of that value. Right, and then uh, find the, uh, the the in a sense the find the formulation to find the. You maximize, the, you, you maximize the likelihood of the augmented data set where you're filling in the missing value with all possible values it, it can take. Exactly. That's, that seems to be what you're doing here. Yeah, exactly. But then because of this missing at random uh, yeah. property, it could actually simplify and get to this nice optimization problem. Yeah. But I have so, to yeah. Yeah. So, so is it known then that uh, by by kind of filling in this fashion, uh, as I get more and more data, uh, will, will I have the consistency in this estimator, or, or what, do I have to have less and less missing data? Uh, what's known about that? So I think uh, yes. So that's something that we we have used in uh, in, in some of the proof. Uh, the more data that you have, in a sense, that this estimator leads to the center of the distribution. Even if the missing part is going to zero. So for example, in this setting, let me we have. So in this setting, for example, yeah. where, where the n goes to infinity, also the radius uh, of the uncertainty goes to zero then. When n goes to infinity, the center of the ambiguity set is also converged to the true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe my analogy is not is not correct. Johannes, <laughs> I apologize. I see that the summation is inside the log and not outside the log, so uh, there might be something different there. Yeah, so think, yeah, yeah. If you, if you have I can share that because I think it sounds like this is a very interesting. Um, uh, I mean, uh, a rather convenient way of, of doing that missing data. So if you have, have that written out, uh, I would be very interested in seeing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure, sure. I, I would be happy to see that. Thank you. Thank you. Yan Zhu, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, great talk. Hi. hi. Um, I just had a question about, um, and this is just more something that I, I was thinking of when I saw your missing data component. So in that talk, you're thinking about missing data in the sense of, I don't have data at specific time periods or things like that. I was thinking about what about a more general version of thinking about like sensor data or sensor demand. So for example, in a warehouse setting, if I only have some amount of inventory, I'm only going to see demand up to that inventory. And once my inventory is at zero, I won't see the, the, the kind of real demand. Um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. So th that's an interesting question. I think there have been lots of work on sensor demand, but uh, it, in this setting, it doesn't have the a structure. Here we have some, in a sense, symmetric structure because 
everything, the missing probability doesn't depend on the values and those, and those, that condition is kind of opposite to the sensor demand. Because the sensor demand, mm -hmm. it depends on some caps or some, but, but that's very interesting. Actually, we try to formulate something for sensor demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was thinking about that for the first part as well, where you have historical demand um, and, you know, your historical demand might not reflect kind of real demand, but just yeah. demand that you observe under the historical operational decisions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a good area to work on. And as far as I know, I think Eric knows better, but there are some interesting paper on VRO for marginal data. I think there are a few works on partially observed data. And I think my our framework is a bit restricted. So I would love to extend that to other more realistic scenarios. But your approach to that seems to be general enough in a sense, like you're identifying the maximum likelihood distribution. Yeah, and then you're building a set around it. So whatever observations you make, whether it's censored, missing, incomplete, you can always have an expression for the likelihood of that observation. And that might, I feel like this would lead to a, a maximum likelihood distribution that you can then use as a center for a ball. Proof that, and unfortunately, I don't have it on top of my head. I will share with you guys later. I have the paper, and I, uh, but it's uh, all the proofs that we have is kind of get uh, the basis on the on the proof of this missing at random assumption. Mm -hmm. So we can, maybe we can do something heuristic. That's that's I completely agree, but I'm not sure if we can prove something. But maybe that's <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. The comment I had was that uh, you use the information about missing data when you do this likelihood estimate, but then you don't reuse the information when uh, you build the, um, the ambiguity set. I'm thinking of cases like uh, perhaps the first term of your vector is missing more often than the second one, so that perhaps you have more ambiguity about that probability or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, would there be a way of also using the some information about what is censored inside the ambiguity set. Here you assume somehow that there's a symmetric effect that all the... It's not a symmetric effect, it's, it's that it doesn't depend on the value of the data. I think this yeah. area is actually include, includes the scenario that, for example, the first component is more often because that doesn't depend on the values of the data. It's kind of a pattern. But I think the, when we were thinking about this problem, we were thinking about the different correlations. So maybe we can think of problems and then we can, uh, we can have more general ambiguity set on correlation values between different mm -hmm. components. I think that would be very interesting. Now, I would feel it would be very interesting to see if we can, if there are some ambiguity set that are more specialized or tuned for the type of problem you're looking at because right now you're using uh, four different balls uh, which are very generic right exactly yeah. but i think that would be so i would love to hear more about the suggestion and, uh, and work more on yeah so i think this was just the first step and first yeah, step. what we added was that we just assumed that we had the uh, marginal observations then we assumed that we have some partial observations but I would love to extend this work, so I would be in touch with you guys, share the paper, and then maybe talk more. Mm -hmm. Another uh, a comment, I wonder um, wh why ambiguity is that? I could have taken a different approach by, for instance, instead of doing maximum likelihood, I could do like maximum entropy with some, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, some information about the data, the, the little that I have. And now I will, I will get somewhat of a, a broad uh, distribution. Uh, would that make sense? And would that, uh, how would the result have changed? Yeah, then I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe the results are equivalent or maybe, but that's a good approach actually because people use that, yeah. That's a good idea.
we officially have five more minutes. So if there's anyone with uh, another question, big or small. No. Uh, well, maybe continue on the discussion here on the, uh, how did you choose your discrete scenarios for the portfolio optimization problem? The discrete scenario, we just, we just look at a, a, a small data sets of the portfolio. So that was a, a small data set and then we could discretize and all, all those, yeah. So you were able to discretize because there were only two assets or something like that, or? There were a, a small assets and the values that we had is kind of, was kind of discrete. So the data set was very nice. So I think when one downside of this work is the discrete support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And having con continuous support, that would be very interesting. And what's the explanation for missing data? You, you started saying there's often missing data in financial data, but uh, when I download from Yahoo Finance, I don't see missing data. <laughs> Probably there's a, someone is uh, doing imputation there for me. <laughs> so uh, I, I think I was, but once we had this idea, I was looking for missing data in many applications. And I think I'm happy to say that also that I found some papers on missing data and portfolio optimization. Okay. okay. But missing data could be a very simple thing that something is for example, some assets you have daily return for the others, maybe you have returns in 10 days and then you have, uh, you know, for some, you, you have longer data for some mm -hmm. you have data and so So, because uh, I was wondering, maybe you chose ETFs because of the, I mean, I wonder if it's related to liquidity of the data, like how, how often are they traded and then you're you're really interested in the trade value and maybe some days you don't have trades for that specific asset and that's the explanation here but i think that's the explanation and the data so once you have the problem then you look for data set that works <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh, i was talking to my friends who are working on power grid and we wrote a proposal on this so i think mm -hmm. over there if we solved some problem that's a real issue yeah. Because, because there are lots of things that can happen on different nodes, like uh, okay. And okay. the other problem that I think is very interesting is that we don't assume that the data not only missing, but the, in a sense, is kind of also corrupted as well. Mm -hmm. oh, that also happened a lot, I think, in Power Okay. Great. Well, uh, we could. Close here. Thank you very much again for the talk and the discussion. Thank you very much for the discussion, and I will be in touch uh, to both of you. Thank you very much for. If you want to stay around, Oda, we uh, we open break rooms between uh, between the talks, so you could we could talk a little bit in a breakout room.